Washington. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Park City, Utah, where there also was a major march. The historic protests worldwide in over 600 cities, towns and hamlets came one day after President Donald Trump's inauguration. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. We assembled here today are issuing a new decree to be heard in every city, in every foreign capital, and in every hall of power. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. Every decision on trade, on taxes, on immigration, on foreign affairs will be made to benefit American workers and American families. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. We will reinforce old alliances and form new ones and unite the civilized world against radical Islamic terrorism, which we will eradicate completely from the face of the earth. That's an excerpt of Donald Trump's inaugural address as the 45th president of the United States. Well, on Friday, Democracy Now! did a special broadcast from Washington, D.C., and featured a roundtable of analysis of Trump's address. We spoke to consumer advocate Ralph Nader, author Naomi Klein, and Professor Kianga Yamata-Taylor, author of From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, investigative reporter Alan Nairn, and Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garza. We began with Ralph Nader. He's going to do a lot of things at once in the first 100 days, unlike Barack Obama, who figured that he could only handle the Democratic Congress with health care. Uh, he's going to try to go on all fronts. And, and that's perilous for him, obviously. But it's also very perilous for the Democratic Party, uh, uh, which now is a minority in, in, in the Congress. That means he's going to get the nominee to the Supreme Court up fast. He's going to start changing the tax system up fast. He's going to start rolling back health and safety and other regulations uh, fast by uh, all kinds of executive action and, and Congress. And so what we're going to see here is a challenge to the stamina of the citizenry, mm -hmm. especially the majority of the people who voted against him. Uh, and whether they organize in every congressional district or they just engage in important but short-lived resistance uh, is the real question now. We have to build sustained power in every congressional district to use that huge leverage over Congress, 535 people whose names we know, uh, as, a, uh, as an opposition to what the uh, Trump administration plans to do. He's now way in over his neck. He doesn't know how to run the government. He doesn't like to work hard. He doesn't like details. He doesn't like to read briefing memos. He doesn't like to be briefed. So we're going to see a huge delegation of authority to his nominees, to his cabinet secretaries, et cetera. And uh, we will see a new media emerge, which is his tweeting media, <laughs> and which is basically his public relations arm to 20, 30 million people uh, that uh, tap into that uh, account. Finally, I think what we, we're going to have to do something to get over the yuck factor. The liberals have to get over the yuck factor. They disagree with conservatives back home on certain issues of, you know, reproductive rights, uh, et cetera, gun control. But there's a huge left-right worker alliance that can be dealt here because, as he alluded to, they all bleed the same way. And as I would expand, they all get ripped off the same way by the health care industry, by the utilities, by the employers by the low wages. That's the uh, alliance for the future against Donald Trump and his billionaires. Naomi Klein. You know, I have to say, listening to this America, this defiant America firstism, it, and, and uh, you know, picking up on what Ralph said about how this is tapping into 
the, the, the failures and the weaknesses of the Democratic Party to, you know, he's speaking directly to people's feeling of being uh, disappeared and neglected and so on. Um, and, and I think until there is a very clear alternative, that will continue to resonate, despite all of the obvious hypocrisies that we've de de delineating all day. Um, it does make me think about something else, though. You know, I have, I, I've been involved in the, the, the free trade battles, you know, for, for, for a couple of decades now, um, you know, taking on, you know, everything, going back to the, the, the original free trade agreement with Canada and then NAFTA and the creation of the WTO and all of that. But I was never comfortable with the way in which particularly the U.S. labor movement used America firstism, right, um, mm. and, and did not use enough the language of internationalism, right, and, and, and including employing easy xenophobic language about the Chinese and, 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 and opposing these deals on the basis of this easy nationalism. And unfortunately, that, I think, moral failure, that moral failure to stand up for principles of international workers' rights, international environmental standards, instead of just this easy hypernationalism, is now something that Trump can and is picking up. We're seeing it right now. Some of these messages aren't that different than the message we heard from unions. I know I'm not going to make some people happy saying that, but it's too familiar. And we can't move forward mm -hmm. making those same mistakes. It's wonderful to see the internationalism in, in the response to Trump. And we're going to need to be an international movement, because this is not just something that's happening in the United States, right? This is happening uh, in the midst of austerity programs around the world. And Donald this, Trump yeah. acknowledged that he was speaking to the world, not just the United yeah, States. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing I did like in, in his speech was the now arrives the hour of action. <clears throat> and seeing as he's appropriated a lot of, um, you know, pseudo populist uh, 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 slogans, I say we take that one <laughs> and uh, apply it to our movements. Kianga, there are a couple of things. One is that with Trump, you can see the move from the kind of dog whistle to the foghorn um, <laughs> around racism. Um, but I think that he's also trying to do something interesting, which is to try to include African Americans into uh, this America first um, by uh, uh, talking about how, you know, we've got the, the crime-infested inner mm -hmm. cities, but we're going to save them, and they're Americans like the rest of them, and we need to include them in our uh, efforts to put down radical Islamic terrorists, in our efforts to build the wall and to keep the Mexicans out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that there is a, a, is a basic incoherence in, uh, um, um, at the heart of that, which is that the policies that uh, uh, Trump is pursuing domestically um, will have a disproportionate impact in their harm um, on African Americans. So, for people who are uh, um, in, in disproportionate need of state protections, um, of a public sector, that the efforts to subvert that, to get rid of those types of regulatory protections, but also those types of, of social welfare programs, will have a devastating impact um, on, on black people in particular. And so the effort to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, unite people around this false idea of America first um, by attacking immigrants, by attacking uh, uh, Muslims is built on um, uh, is built on sand in some ways, and is built on uh, uh, incoherence. Naomi Klein. It's interesting that his chosen model for this was the military, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, we all. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he said, you know, as, as yes. soldiers know, we all bleed the same, right? And, and and so that's what he's holding up, right? As 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 the model of going to war, and you know overwhelmingly against Muslim countries, um, and this sort of heavily armed, united America against all enemies. And, and, and I think that that's, that's the plan. That's, that's the game plan. Alan, uh, to get a comment on that speech, President Trump just gave his 15-minute inaugural address. Your thoughts? Uh, I, it's the most substantive inaugural address I can remember hearing. Uh, usually, they're full of platitudes. This was packed with political program. And it shows how serious this guy is. 
and how serious uh, this movement is. Uh, we're really facing a national emergency now. Uh, it's not a joke. Uh, he's not incompetent. Um, Trump has a team of the most consisting of the most radical political party in American hist history, arguably since 1860, the, Rep the current Republicans. He has a cabinet who believe in oligarchy unbound, uh, without limits, a lot of whom, and a lot of the individuals in there look to be very competent at their assigned task of dismantling those aspects of their respective departments that serve the poor or working people as opposed to the rich. And in that speech, which was a collection of the most severe moments from his stump speeches, you really felt, again, some of the fascist undertones that ran through his campaign. I mean, this was a real signal. People better organize now. Uh, because up to now, in the course of this campaign, you know, American progressives have not done very well. Um, it was remarkable that Sanders got as far as he did, but he didn't make it over the line, which is all that, in a sense, is all that counts in the end. And Trump could not be stopped. I want to uh, ask Alicia and Alan, too, for their final thoughts on this, and just read. Uh, someone has compiled a list of words uh, that were mm. used for the first time in a U.S. inaugural address. I'll just read a few of them. Bleed, carnage, depletion, ripped, rusted, sad, stealing, Tombstones. Okay, that's just a, a random list. The, the list is much longer of words that have not been used before. And what some of those words indicate is a, uh, or gesture at is a more uh, explicit violence um, than has ever been. I mean, one could argue that an inaugural address is always about a certain kind of nationalism, whereas, but it's an implicit kind of violence. This, the words here are uh, somehow lay bare what American power. Trump would like American power to be. So your final thoughts on that, Alicia, and then Alan. Well, I think the inaugural address made it really clear what America Trump wants to, quote unquote, make great again. Um, but what feels really clear for me is that he does not have a mandate, um, that the words that we would use, right, absolutely would be resistance, would be ungovernable, would be disrupt, uh, would be defiant. Uh, but I think that there's also very much um, words that are being used today, like solidarity and love and resistance and care. Um, and I'm carrying that into the Women's March tomorrow, quite frankly, uh, where there will be at minimum of quarter of a million people who have traveled from all over the world to show their resistance, but also to show that we, our futures are connected with one another. Mm. Um, and that's what is carrying me through uh, this incredibly sad day. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, what's important about the list that you've generated is that it makes it really clear what their agenda is. Um, they are masters at trying to mask what it is that they actually want to do. Um, and so we should take this as an indication of the America that they want to see um, and use it as our compass to move away from mm -hmm. um, and to orient all of our work around. Alan Nair. Well, you know, as they say, <clears throat> every person can, contains multitudes. Within everyone, there's this capacity for tremendous uh, nobility and also the capacity to do horrible things, mm -hmm. to commit the most atrocious crimes. And Trump has, like other demagogues, has this ability to reach inside, reach inside the soul of, of many people and pull out the worst. Mm. But it doesn't have to be that way. A given person uh, is not only their own worst instincts. You can reach inside that same person and pull out the best. And 
what a person does and to a large extent depends upon uh, the situation that's presented to them, the, the conditions they're living under, the challenges that are, that are put to them. Trump has put a certain ch set of challenges, particularly to white Americans, and he's gotten this very ug ugly uh, response. But just if some very simple things had been done by the bureaucratic, corporate, democratic uh, uh, party, <coughs> And they had presented a more a, a constructive agenda that simply responded to uh, to people's needs for uh, for for work, uh, for salary. We would have had an entirely different outcome uh, in the uh, election, and we wouldn't now be facing the very real threat on the street of perhaps vigilante violence, more racist violence from cops, uh, all these menaces, and uh, God knows what could be unleashed uh, overseas by uh, General Mattis and, uh, and Trump. This could easily have swung the other way, and it can still swing the other way. You know, when the pendulum goes uh, this far, the energy is gathered, and it's poised to swing uh, almost as far back in the other direction. And I think that's where we are politically now. Now, uh, four years from now, uh, sooner, we could be talking about a, revolu a revolution of a different sort in a much more constructive direction. But we have to make that happen. Journalist Alan Nair and Black Lives Matter founder Alicia Garza, Professor Kianga Yamata Taylor, Naomi Klein, and Ralph Nader. To binge watch our 12 hours of special coverage from the inauguration and the Women's March on Washington, go to democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Berkner, Marine Shea, Carla Wills, Laura Goddess, Dina Dina Gesder, Sam Alcoff, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Trina Duran, Andre Lewis, Julie Crosby. Thanks to our crew here in New York, Trina and Dennis Moynihan and John Hamilton and Nicole Salazar. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for having me.